Everyone, thank you for coming. I just want to introduce our speaker today. It is my honor to be able to introduce him. He's uh, graduated, he started his career at Midwestern University where he graduated as a doctor of osteopathic medicine, similar to us. Um, he did a surgery internship in Denver. His residency in anesthesiology was at Yale, and he uh, did a pediatric anesthesia fellowship at um, Seattle Children's Hospital as well. He also, and, and for today's talk, which is international medicine, Dr. Mulek also did do a stint with Doctors Without Borders in Nigeria, and then also worked in New Zealand, practicing as an intensive care physician as well. He came back to the USA and completed his second fellowship in pediatric anesthesia, and finally settled at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. So it's my great honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mulek. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? I gotta take this thing off because it's. <laughs> um, so, just um, I had no financial disclosures, but there are some graphic slides, and when we get to that point, I will warn you so you can look away and enjoy your lunch. Um, so you guys, uh, thanks for some people who were completed the surveys that I sent out. So what, what got me interested in traveling? I think I've always been interested in traveling, but when I was in your shoes, um, you know, this is kind of like what, where you guys are at right now. I took this survey and basically everyone's worried about board scores, all this stuff. Around that time though, someone showed me this picture. Does anyone know where this is? I know one person's been there probably. But someone showed me this picture and I was trying to figure out what to do between my first and second year of medical school. And this is Machu Picchu in Peru. And I was like, where is that? I have to go to that. I just, I have to go. And that's kind of, that's how I would describe it with traveling. It's just like, I just, I have to do it. And I see somewhere and I, I get really excited about it. And I'm sure you guys are probably the same. Um, around this time, Sort of right up before, I guess right before I took step one, we had this surgeon came in and, and talked to us, and he he was giving us a lecture, and he said, "You're never going to have more time, more free time than you do right now." And that we looked at each other, we're like, "That's terrifying," because we were studying like 12 hours a day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, is, and you know what? He was he was actually right. He was right for about for about five or six years. He was right. Um, and but don't worry. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a piece of advice that's gonna help you. Um, I had another piece of advice from an anesthesiologist at the end of medical school, and he said the cool thing about medical school, like when you, like around the time that you finish medical school, you're basically standing in the middle of a compass, and you can do anything with that you want with your life. You can go anywhere and do anything that you want. And he was right. Um, so I put together this slideshow and it's 10 lessons I've learned from traveling the world. Obviously there's probably a million lessons, but I try to just, let's just boil it down to 10. And by the way, um, if you ever see someone that's going to try to do this, like just be prepared to uh, treat someone for burns. This is a bad idea. <laughs> this happened in uh, Nicaragua. Um, when I was in your shoes, uh, I guess if no, it was the end of MS one year. I really wanted to work for Doctors Without Borders. That was something I had heard about it. I'm like, I want to do that. And they said, sorry, give us a call when you're a doctor. It's, it's called Doctors Without Borders, not students. But it sounds like from just one of your colleagues who's told me they're actually, they do, they are allowing things to be done as students. So that's great. Some things have changed. But I did want to work for Doctors Without Borders and they said no. So I, I decided to kind of plan my own um, international experience and, and volunteer work. Um, the different, there's, there's a lot of different things that can be done, lots of different missions from basically like one week primary care to a very well, well organized surgical mission, like one week, maybe even two weeks. Um, there's also the option of just basically having no structure. I even did, I did that one time where I did, there was just no structure at all. I was kind of walking into villages and just telling people I was a doctor. Um, then there's Doctors Without Borders, which is more well-organized, three to six months and, and ongoing projects. Um, we need to talk about, there's an issue of sustainability that I'm gonna to talk to you guys about. Then there's the idea of actually just living somewhere permanently. That's a, a long-term thing, like greater than one year. And then there's um, Expedition Medicine, which I've done that as well. And those are short-term projects. So I've done all of these different things. So lots of different variety. 
Um, so at the end of, end of the first year, I decided that I had basically like one goal, and I was going to learn Spanish. Because um, I didn't speak a lick of Spanish, and I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. And I was able to find this medical mission that was going to Costa Rica and Nicaragua, and it was only going to be about two weeks. And then after that, I was going to go to Peru because I wanted to see Machu Picchu. So I, I went and did this 10-day primary care mission. And the first thing I found out is like language is everything. So that's lesson number one. It's like basically like it's, it's all about being able to communicate with people. And so like me not being able to speak any Spanish, it's like I, it, it wasn't very useful and I felt very awkward right, right from the beginning. Um, we went to this place called Punta Reynas, and I don't know if anyone's heard of the Blue Zone, but Blue Zones are, are the five areas of the world where people live the longest. And it was really neat because we went there and I was expecting to see um, we did see a lot of disease, a lot of tropical illness, but I saw something really interesting in the community, which is very happy people that really didn't have anything. And that's kind of the opposite of what I saw in the United States, which is people have everything and were actually relatively unhappy. Um, so we set up this makeshift clinic in um, kind of near the coast, and we just started seeing people. We're doing primary care type stuff. And this is kind of how it looks. We had, we had some students that were like pre-medical, and then there was myself, a medical student, and then a few. Then there was like one doctor, um, and it, this was the first time I ever saw something called volunteerism. Volunteerism? I don't know how to say it, but it's um. And the question of ethics entered my mind, which is, uh, you know, like what what when you go to another country, you you there isn't really any restrictions or anything, and you may be in a position to actually do things that you're not allowed to do here. So I would I would encourage you to be very careful about this. Um, but this is kind of how it works. Where it was, it's a really easy thing to do, which is primary care. We just had some ba like antibiotics and antacids, and you know nothing like long term. So it wasn't a very sustainable type of mission, um, and and, it, and the question of ethics was raised. And you know, but it, I had a lot of fun actually, just really just um, interacting with the people and. I think probably the, the thing that was most memorable was that I was spent a lot of time with the children and they were teaching me Spanish. So that's kind of what was a little bit about that mission was all about learning language. The other thing that I noticed too is that I was trying to talk to these people, they were all lining up to get medicines and I was trying to speak Spanish and they were all laughing at me and just kept laughing and, and they were having like a, a great time and I had to pause and think, wait a second, like these people aren't really suffering, they really, the community is really amazing. Um, so I had to kind of like think, you know, it, it's not, it wasn't so much, it was almost like I, I had went in there thinking that I was going to go in and save the world and just save these people, and that, that's just not really the case, you know. Um, they were doing just fine and they just really didn't have um, medicines and we had some basic medicines that they didn't have. So um, the next thing that I want to tell you is that when you go and do these missions, it's about building relationships. You're going to meet people that are gonna become like good friends of yours for the rest of your life. So this is Santiago, he was, he was the person that I lived with when I was in Costa Rica, and he runs these um, primary care missions in all over Latin America, and he's become one of my best friends, and he, you know, I, when, whenever I go to Costa Rica, I get to stay with him, and we get to hang out, we talk all the time, and so it, it's, you know, it's about building relationships. So once I got done with that um, part of my, my summer, then I said, okay, I'm going to Peru. I want to go see um, Machu Picchu. And I didn't really have any other plans than that. I just showed up. And um, I had basically like that whole summer, like nine weeks with no itinerary. And, and, I, and I did it. I did Machu Picchu. I did the Inca Trail. I did it twice. Um, and I, I worked on my Spanish. Basically, like no matter what, like at the end of that trip, my goal was to learn and be fluent in Spanish. Um, I, people kind of found out, like I, I was in Cusco for a couple weeks, people found out that I was a medical student and the one guy invited me to come down to the Amazon and he said, can you come down to the Amazon? We've got some sick people, could you just, I, and I said, hey, that sounds cool and everything. Of course I get down there and I'm like, there's no, there's no supplies, there's no, I have no medicine, I just had a stethoscope. And so, you know what I started doing? I basically just started, um, Hang on one sec. I realized that it's it's not so much about the the, the medical skills in, on this particular trip. It was the knowledge, and 
already at the level that you're at right now, you have a ridiculous amount of knowledge. This is like an explosion of knowledge that you have to offer the world. And, and, and so I, just was, I was just teaching people about basically basic nutrition and, and eating and, and trying not to eat too much sugar. Um, this is a picture of uh, when I was, I was working in Nicaragua, and this is the pharmacy, and there's basically no meds. So it's like, you can come, like as a student, you can come in and say, hey, I'm going to save the world, and I'm going to do all this stuff, and they're like, oh, okay, we have no meds. And they actually have really intelligent doctors down there, and it's like, the problem was that they had no supplies and no medicines. So I had to shift my perspective. Um, so this is me just teaching this guy who wasn't really taking care of himself about just basically just doing some yoga and trying to move his body. That's one of the great things about being a DO is that you actually do have a skill set that you can do. I was treating people's like back pain. Um, so there's a lot that you can already do right now. I know um, a lot of people had asked about like what, what is gonna be applicable? Like what specialty should I do if I really wanna do international medicine? It doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you're gonna be useful. Um, so I got den I got dengue fever when I was in the Amazon, and uh, it wasn't really it was basically like having the flu. And um, when I finished MS two year and I, and I took my boards, I went to Thailand for like ten days, and that was just purely vacation with my friend. And I got dengue fever again. So you guys know what happens when you get dengue fever the second time? It's called dengue hemorrhagic fever, and I wound up in the hospital with a platelet count less than 50, I had pancytopenia, my legs turned purple, and I thought I was gonna die. So it was like probably one of the worst experiences of my life, and I really got to, real, I got to see what it felt like to be a patient, and it was awful, I felt so vulnerable. Um, I chose anesthesia, real quickly, anesthesia is, the, it's the composite of a couple different things, it's analgesia, amnesia, and immobility, and you put all that together with medications to make the patient safe. Um, I kind of wanted to do surgery, but I honestly I couldn't make up my mind. And the things I liked about anesthesia was I liked reading about it. I liked the, I I had assumed it was a, there was a flexible lifestyle. I was, you know, I kind of realized that you can make a flexible lifestyle whatever you choose. But I liked that there was no clinic. I found myself never watching the clock. I enjoyed doing procedures, and I like that it had a favorable medical legal outlook. Like anesthesia is the safest specialty. We're all about monitoring safety, uh, and it had a good compensation because I came out of medical school with over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of student loans, and that's not cool. So um, the other thing I like about anesthesia is that there's this A to Z skill set, which is basically you can just kind of do everything. Um, you can go into a code and do everything. You can like, like decide what medication to give. You know the doses, you give the, the drugs. You can unwrap IV sets. You can, um, do, you can put in central lines, you can intubate. Um, we're the only doctor, doctors in the hospital that actually will, you know, I, I guess ICU doctors and ER doctors can do this too, but for the most part, we're the, we're the rare ones that will think about a drug, like mix the drug up ourselves and administer it ourselves. So that, I thought that was kind of cool. I got into my fourth year, I decided to do anesthesia, and right at, right at the time of the match, I was trying to figure out what am I gonna do with the rest of school, because um, it, was a, it was a unique time. So I needed an elective, and my, one of my best friends was getting married in India. And so, um, guess what happened? Like, someone showed me a picture and told me that they had done a research elective in Nepal, at Mount Everest. And they did research with the Himalayan Rescue Association, and I said, that's it, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing that, and uh, no matter what, I got to see Mount Everest. There was, I mean, I, I, I was blown away. And so I went to India, and uh, I mean, I had just like one of the best times of my life. And if you ever get invited to an Indian wedding, you should go, because it's basically like a six days of just, you know, having fun with a, a family. So, in, so Delhi is like crazy. It's like if you, driving in Delhi is insane. If you can drive in Delhi, you can go anywhere. But there's bicycles and tuk-tuks and car accidents everywhere. Um, this is basically all my stuff. I had, basically I had planned to be just out of the country for like, you know, two months. Um, this is us at this wedding, Taj Mahal. Uh, and then after the wedding, I, had, I flew up to Kathmandu. And in Kathmandu, I met my research team, and it was basically about six, six weeks of research, um, again, at the end of medical school. 
And it was like, it was so much fun because we're just on this adventure together and we um, flew out to the Everest Valley and we started doing research. And what we were doing is we were, we were looking at the effects of um, ginkgo biloba and, uh, and, and diamox uh, and whether or not it had prevented altitude sickness. So it was a very difficult study, but, but what was cool was it was a, a long project and it allowed me to do some hiking and climbing and really kind of like get into the community and do some volunteer work, um, see some patients, and also take care of climbers and English speaking like climbers. So I thought it was a really neat experience. Um, I've never seen, I mean, I, I, I lived in Colorado for a long time. My parents live in Colorado, but I've never seen mountains so high. And there's a picture of the river going up the Everest Valley and it's just like, it's, an, it's insane, these mountains go up over 20,000 feet. So, um, what I think is neat is the next, the next lesson I learned is to actually see a, a very valuable, um, it's, a, it's about perspective. So seeing the United States in a new way, sort of seeing it as an outsider, which I think is really important. Um, at the time, this, we, we, the United States had just engaged in the Iraq War, and we were not popular. And we're kind of like not popular again uh, in, in, in the world. And when you go outside of this country and you see how people view like American government, like it really sort of changes your perspective. So one of the things that we saw happening was American tourists were actually sewing Canadian flags on their backpacks because they did not want to be identified as Americans. And the Maoists were actually kidnapping people um, in various regions of Nepal. So there was a lot of kidnappings going on. And so, um, so we were very frightened by that. And I got the chance to talk to a lot of people and they, I really learned a lot. So I learned a lot about like kind of the different things that the United States was doing with the World Bank and um, uh, how what the United States actions were doing was affecting like local economies in poor countries. So the perspective change was really um, great. So I finally did get to see Mount Everest. This is from Namche Bazaar, but it's just peeking up over Nupse, and it was really like one of the coolest experiences of my life. I got to see the um, Everest Base Camp Clinic and meet Luann Freer, and um, actually got to climb a small peak called Island Peak with um, this guy on the right. His name is uh, Nuang Sherpa, and he was the guy that carried the IMAX, IMAX camera in that uh, famous 1996 Everest team. So this guy was like, he's probably like 50 pounds lighter than me, but probably twice as strong as me in the mountains. Um, so it was really cool to be able to um, combine uh, basically volunteer work, medical work with my love of the outdoors. Um, I'm just gonna skip a couple of things here. One of the things that I learned, this is the next lesson, but one of the things I learned was, it was, it was very weird. I knew, I didn't have a lot of money, and obviously you guys are students, so you know you're on a budget, right? What I realized was to make it to, the, to, make it to graduation, I had a certain amount of money. So a certain amount of money was gonna be paid for rent, and then I had a fixed amount. And I basically I needed the money to last until graduation that I didn't really have anymore. And what I, what I started to realize that was happening in Nepal is that my money was not running out at all. Um, in fact, I was actually better, I, I found that I was better off if I stayed in Nepal longer than going back to, back to the United States. So like it was weird because people were like, oh my God, like, when are you coming back? Are you gonna run out of money? I'm like, no, I'll run out of money if I go back to school. So I tried to extend my trip as long as possible and I learned something called geographic arbitrage. Have you guys ever heard of this? No, no one's ever heard of this? So, so um, at the time, I can't remember what the exchange rate was, but I looked at this, I looked this up yesterday. So the Nepalese rupee is 114 to the dollar. And I looked up, um, I had been to Vietnam also, and Vietnam also is a, is a very poor country, where the dollar is so much stronger that, um, in this case, it's yes. As of yesterday, the, the Vietnamese dong is twenty-three thousand dong to the dollar. So when I compared the cost of living in Saigon, um, basically four hundred dollars is all you would need for an entire month for a single person, and that's basically all your rent, all your expenses, and actually to live quite quite lavishly. Um, I compared it to uh, basically living in St. George. So like. Eating at a very eating a meal would be like two dollars, 
eating at McDonald's, three or four dollars. Um, this is comparing like Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City to St. George. So like you can get an apartment for like four hundred dollars, and then an apartment, one bedroom apartment in St. George is like a thousand. I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what this website says. Anyway, so. What's the point? Well, the point is, in, in some ways, it's not really fair because some people around the world are living, they're, it's very, they're very poor, right? And we have a lot here in the USA. And what it taught me was that if I could be happy there living on like so little, I could really, I could be happy here living on much less. So it taught me to try to live within my, within my means, you know, live on way less money than what Americans typically spend. Um, Take a look at this uh, picture. Let's say you have a construction worker who makes $40,000 a year, and he's able to save 10% of his income. And then of course you've got a rich doctor, he makes $400,000 a year, and he saves 10%, $40,000 a year. Who will be able to retire first? Raise your hand if you think that the doctor is able to retire first. So a few people, a few hands. So it's the same retirement date. Now, how could that be? Well, they're both saving only 10% of their income. That means they're spending 90%. So if a doctor is actually spending most of what he earns, it's going to be a very long time before he retires. Okay, so this is, um, this is from a website called Net Worthify. Basically, it's, uh, I don't want to get too much into this, but if you, if you adjust your spending, you basically can change your retirement date from like 62 years, which is most Americans, they basically like, they're on a retirement track of like 62 years. But if you save like more than 60 or 70% of your income, you can retire in like five years. I'm just gonna plant that seed. You guys think about that later. Um, the difference between basically not retiring and retiring early is maybe not driving a fancy car, maybe riding your bike to work, maybe maybe just cooking your own meals. I mean, it's amazing what, what can happen. Okay, anyway, so um, I wanna show you what it looks like to do a plastic surgery mission. Um, when I got, into, I got into residency, and residency was really tough, and it just seemed like there was not really a lot of time for you. This is in uh, Thailand. Okay, so in Thailand, I went. Uh, this, I was a, a fourth year. Or, um, I was in my fourth year residency, so I was a senior anesthesia resident, and I got to go on this Thailand trip, and it was plastic surgery, and it was probably one of the it was one of the best experiences ever. I just had like a lot of fun with my uh, attendings, I had a lot of fun with the local people, and that, again, that goes back to like building relationships. But um, we we just had a lot of fun, and this is like one of my one of my classmates, and we were just like goofing off a little bit, but. Um, just because like the equipment was like a little bit different, but the same like you can still practice the same medicine And you we, you just have to make a few adjustments with some different equipment, but we were doing plastic surgery cases and um, You know not a very not not a sustainable mission because we we're there for like 10 days and then we left so uh, There are some ethics. I didn't really think about the ethics at the time But now I think about like what happened if we, what would happen if we had surgical complications after all the surgeons left. You know, um, that's something that you should you should ask yourself. One of the things that's really fun about um, when you go on these trips, though, is that it's like there's just so much fun, and it's all the little differences that make it fun. So, um, it, yeah, and then we just, like, just tons of fun with the local people. They really treated us well. This is my, uh, just one of the other medical students and I just basically dancing. But anyway, so, um, that then, at, you know, when I did my fellowship, not, not a lot of opportunity for me to, to get out and do some long medical missions. I still wanted to do Doctors Without Borders. Um, I started, uh, Doctors Without Borders, they told me, like, we really want you to try to, 
you know, get board certified before you come and work with us. And so getting board certified is a long process, but I finally did it. But I, I really found myself being very frustrated with the American medical system, and I kept thinking, for a long time I kept thinking it was me, but I realized that it, was, it wasn't really me, it was, like, it was sort of the way we practice medicine in America, and kind of how it's, it's all about this business and this corporate structure. Um, that's not to say we don't have like loving and caring people that are within the system that care about people. It's just that the system itself has really become uh, very difficult to work within and do the right thing. So if you ask any patient right now, when you ask any doctor you know right now, most people are really frustrated with our system. So after I finished my first year of uh, working as an attending, I said, that's it, I'm out. I got my boards and it's time to do Doctors Without Borders. So I basically had a little bit of money saved in the bank and I decided that I just had, there wasn't any other, there was, it was the best time ever to do it. I had no agenda. They said, can you give us like three to four months? If you do primary care, they, they ask you for about six months. But um, in this case, they wanted about three or four months. I said, yeah, sure. Um, this lesson, there was a lesson of adaptability. So as you start to go into um, working in travel medicine or just medicine in general, you're gonna need to learn to be very adaptable. So the first thing they did was they said, okay, based on our needs, we want you to go to Sri Lanka. And I said, okay, that's cool and everything. And I, I had some time to research it. There was some, there was a little bit of violence in the area and I had to research um, snake bites because uh, they were seeing a lot of snake bites. And, and they said, you're gonna have to practice some emergency medicine, which you know I hadn't really done since med school. And I said, okay, that's fine. You know, I'm excited for that. I was a little nervous and then like, a couple days before I was supposed to go, they said, we are, um, we're sorry, but we can't get your visa done in time. Can you go to Sudan instead? And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, I, I wasn't ready for that, and I was terrified. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Doctors Without Borders. Founded in 1971, Doctors Without Borders, what they do is they're, basically it's, they're all about neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Impartiality means like, we don't take sides in our conflict. Um, neutrality, it's basically the same idea, but we stay, you know, stay neutral. Um, and independent is really important. And so where the money is actually coming from is private donations. And then they spend, for the most part, they really put all the money right back into the program. So doctor's lab orders will send doctors to places of armed conflict, places where there's malnutrition, epidemics, environmental disasters. Um, people that are just excluded otherwise from healthcare, same, that, that could be from armed conflict or natural disasters. And there's a lot of primary health clinics. So if you went into primary care, there's like literally just tons and tons of opportunity. They have mobile clinics where you have these like, um, when I went to Nigeria, there were, these there were these little populations living in the Delta south and southern Nigeria. And the only way to get out there was to take a boat. Um, and then obviously surgery was a big one, and then vac vaccinations and nutritional support. Um, so, the, so anyway, the main types of missions would be disease outbreak, armed conflict, or natural disasters. And so they said, well, can you go to, you know, can you go to Sudan? Um, oh, the, somebody had asked me like, what, what would be a good specialty, or what specialty is in demand? And the answer is really like, it, it's, it's everything, I mean, it's, Right now they say like the, de the demands are constantly changing. So you can't really, like whatever you do, you're gonna be in demand. But I was part of what they call the gas pool. And that's the, a pool of people that do anesthesia surgery or GYN OB. And there was, and this pool is very high demand. So there's always, an, there's always a high need for anesthesia. There's always a high need for surgery. Um, so they, they said, uh, you, you know, can you go to Sudan? And I was terrified and I decided I was gonna do it. Um, I read as much as I could about Sudan in like the day or two and I finally just said, you know what, if I'm gonna die or whatever, I have to just go. And, and um, uh, I mean, I could, you, something could happen to me, I was in New York City at the time and something could happen to me in New York City, but I'm like, this is something that I had dreamed of, it's time to go. So I, I was really terrified. Um, I had to go to Uganda first and wait for my Sudanese visa to clear. And when I finally got to Sudan, and I, and I was right in the Darfur region. You guys heard of Darfur, there was genocide in 2004. I mean, it's a lot of bad stuff was happening. But you fly in these little planes, um, and it kind of felt like that. But, and then you just land, I mean, we land in the middle of 
literally nowhere. I felt I never felt so far away from home. But you land, it's like 115 degrees, and you're just in the red desert. And I, I really just felt very alone. And and you know, for someone who's traveled a lot, I I, I don't think I've ever felt like that before. Um, and I had, of course, the thing that terror, like really I hate about <laughs> going to these places is mosquitoes because I already had dengue fever twice. So I wasn't excited about having dengue fever again. And, and there was a, it was the middle of a malaria epidemic and there was meningitis. Um, but you know, we had a, I had a ton of, of fun. I mean, you, you ride around in these land cruisers with displaying the Doctors Without Border flag and there's a lot of pride in that. And um, everyone is living in these like straw and mud huts. I mean, it's very primitive. And uh, people are pulling their stuff around with like horses. And we lived in this compound, um, these little tuples. And I never slept, I mean, it was very difficult to sleep. You just lay in bed and sweat, it was so hot. Um, the food was not good and I got sick, but I was happy. I was really happy, despite all that stuff. Um, just a, a video of the road. Um, so they take me, the first day I get there, they take me to the hospital. And part of, part of being adaptable is also seeing things and doing things that you've never done before. And this is a video, they took me to the hospital and they said, can you help out? And this is the first patient I saw. Does anybody know what this is? Okay, uh, same disease, different, different patient. Anybody know? Raise your hand if you know what this is. Can't open the mouth. Can't breathe. No. Good guess though. So it's one of the first things that you get vaccinated against when you're a baby. No, not pertussis. No, no, you don't get you don't get mumps until two years. What's another one? What happens when you what happens if you step on a nail and it's like, oh, you need to get that shot? What's that shot? Tetanus. So it was tetanus. So we saw a lot of tetanus. I'd never seen it before and I never met anybody that saw it, but we saw a lot of tetanus. And that's because they had unsafe um, G1, uh, OB practices. Basically what would happen is that they would deliver in, um, in their home, like in the hut, and it was all dirt. And then they would use like either um, a, a dirty knife, or sometimes they were even using like a blade, like a like a reed, like this sharp, like plant, and then they would shove dirt in the umbilical stump of the baby, and so we were seeing neonatal tetanus. And if you couldn't, if you if they had to go on the ventilator, they would die because we had basically we didn't have a ventilator. Um, so and the mortality is actually quite high without. I mean, it's very high without. It's certain death without treatment. So. Um, so we saw a lot of tropical illnesses, things, it was really weird because I was seeing things like here in America I see, I see people like running away from vaccines and basically being scared of vaccines and there are people were lining up for vaccines because they're like, oh my god, like they knew how valuable it was. So it's really interesting like perspective change being in, in this place. This is an older kid who got um, tetanus and this is Rhizus sardonicus. This is actually kind of like a creepy thing because he's not smiling, his, his muscles are stuck like this. Um, same thing here. Anyway, so high mortality, I'll just skip some of this stuff. Pathophysiology, you guys can read about that. We don't have a lot of tetanus here. Um, we might see a resurgence with people being afraid of, or uh, con like more conscious about vaccines, but um, what we usually don't see a lot here. So a lot of what I was doing was anesthesia, but we didn't have a surgeon, so I was doing a little bit of anesthesia and a little bit minor surgery, and that was really weird for me because in America, I feel like we, you just kind of like, you think about like whatever your job is, whatever your specialty is, and then like that's what you do, and you don't ever really step outside of that, and it's not like that with Dr. Sock Waters. You're going to be having to push your comfort zone and do some different things. So we had a women's and children's uh, hospital, and so I, I did a lot of um, surgery for uh, C-sections, and then a lot of like general anesthesia for just wound debridements, lots of infections. But I found myself doing like a lot of the, of the actual like surgical debridements as well. 
This is like this, um, not much of an anesthesia machine, it's basically just um, very, very primitive type stuff, like whatever people would donate. Um, they didn't, there was no point in uh, using oxygen because oxygen in these poor countries is not sustainable. So you get like one tank and then it's gone. And it's also very dangerous to have tanks around because you never really know what they would be filled with. So we use these things called oxygen concentrators. So you can, you can concentrate oxygen and it was something that was sustainable. Um, we had the, it was the hottest, uh, hottest place I've ever been and you just couldn't stop sweating. So to put your surgical gloves on, you had to put your hands up by the air conditioner and there was only one air conditioner in the village and that was in the, um, the operating room. So I saw a lot of burns. What was happening there was a lot of the young children, like the seven-year-old was like supervising like the three and four-year-old and the parents were uh, just not around. So lots of burns. Um, Lots of infections. This is, okay, this is going to be a graphic slide, but I saw one uh, girl had got her hand mangled. And, um, you know, and basically, I, and I didn't have the technical training to basically to do hand surgery, but I had to do something because I was worried she was going to bleed to death. So I tried to do what I could and um, just to keep her from bleeding to death. And uh, it was pretty bad. So we also had a burn patient and, um, you know, a severe, greater than 60% body surface area burns, like have, they don't really do well even in the best burn centers in America and the United States. And this patient had more than like 60 or 70% burns. And the team was actually quite, like they just kind of like weren't really aware, like this was not going to go well. And part of it was trying to figure out like what is the right thing to do. And we just didn't have what it, the, you know, what, what we needed to take care of this patient, but we couldn't transfer them either, so we did what we could, and it was just a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, like, sort of, like, ethical challenges. Um, we saw lots of, like, interesting, like, uh, things like crocodile bites and hippopotamus bites and um, cobra spitting in the eyes. Um, then, of course, I wound up getting sick. This is a, I'll skip through this, but, like, I wound up, basically, I was working and uh, just being sick from the food, I thought I had malaria, but it basically was just like, it was just like gastroenteritis, but I was very happy here because I had my negative malaria test. And, um, you know, I had a lot, of, a lot of fun. It was like basically just trying to speak the language and they have they, this um, very like primitive dialect, this Dinka dialect is kind of fun with all the clicks and stuff. And I just had like a lot, just a lot of fun. And it was really, it was all about just having fun with the local people um, was one of the best experiences of my life. So the next mission really taught me something about appreciating what we have in the United States. So I went to Nigeria, and I thought, like, I got this. This is easy. I go to Nigeria. This is my second mission with Doctors Without Borders. So within, like, basically a couple minutes of landing at the hospital, we get in a car accident. The person that came to pick me up, we, we rear-ran somebody. So then he decides, the driver decides to like take off with me in the car. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you needed to get out. And he's like, no, 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 there's nothing I'm gonna do. Anyway, so the other guy caught us and they had a, a fight with knives with me in the car. And I have like no way to contact anybody. And we get surrounded by like a mob of people, a mob of people surrounded the, the car. And I'm like, this is, this is how it ends. This is the end of my life. Um, well, of course, that's actually not what happened. The mob came to break up the fight, and you know, that's me in the front seat. I was terrified. So we get to the. Um, I'm terrified though. So we get to the. We get to our base, and um, this guy is like, Michael, how was the trip? You know, and I was like, it's not good. I'm, I'm you know, it, it's, I'm not happy. And uh, he said, go have a coffee, and I blew up the coffee pot because the electric electrical. The electricity is like kind of um, crazy in, in some of these countries, so I blew the coffee pot up and nothing's going well. And it's like very different from my, my, my trip to Sudan. Um, Nigeria is crowded, it's really crowded. It's like they have, um, it's the most crowded country in, in all of Africa and there's just tons of accidents. And so what we were doing was we were, we were a trauma center. We were just taking care of people in, from traffic accidents. And I, um, when the next day I was, I was uh, driving to my hospital, we got in another car accident, you know? 
And uh, <laughs> so I was like, I was basically already wanted to leave within like the first day. I was like, I'm like, this is, you know. So it just, it just showed me like there's, there's, it's, every trip is different. And when I finally got to the hospital, you know, I'm terrified. And they said, okay, well, you need to keep this um, with you. And, it, and I'm like, what's that? And they're like, this is a kidnapping survival kit. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Kidnapping survival kit? I'm like, they're like, yeah. And uh, kidnapping survival kit means that you have malaria medicine, some money. And I was like, well, are you telling me that you really expect that kidnappers are going to let me take malaria medicine? And they're like, well, you know, you're no good to them dead. So yeah, they'll probably let you take your malaria medicine if you get malaria. Um, so anyway. So we did a lot of trauma, lots of degloving injuries. Um, most of what we had to do was, the first stage was do external fixators, which is like a very sophisticated, like it's great in the USA, you do these X fixes, but um, there it was like, you know, uh, it's harder to come by, but in this particular instance at this trauma center, we had everything we needed. So we would do external fixators, heal all the wounds, and then bring them back for an internal, um, open reduction internal fixation. So just lots and lots of like trauma, sometimes like violent trauma, knife injuries, um, really interesting like sort of like uh, blood, the, um, we didn't have any, like we didn't have a blood bank, so if someone needed a blood transfusion, it would have to be a, a family member. Um, we had you know, gunshot wound to the neck. Um, I had to ride in the back of a Land Cruiser transfusing this police officer that was shot in the neck and we had, I had to take him to a different hospital and there was like shooting in the streets while we were driving. So I, I it was, you know, it was something else. <laughs> um, so I was very, I was actually, I was actually quite pleased with, um, with my Sudan trip. And I was, I was like, after that, I'm like, I, I think I'm going to be done with Dr. Left Wars. I'm going to do something different. And I, I decided I wanted to go do this expedition. And uh, I went and climbed uh, Aconcagua in Argentina. And I took like basically two months off. And I did the climb. And um, I climbed with this guy, Mike Campbell. He, he's climbed a lot of the uh, seven summits in Everest. And I think I'll just skip in the interest of time. I'm going to skip. One of the things that's really great about traveling is just the adventure. Um, I'm going to skip this too. So when I went to New Zealand, um, I went to New Zealand because I wanted to, I still wanted to, to live abroad. And I, um, I knew that there was going to be like, it wasn't going to be dangerous like going to Africa. And, uh, and I decided I'm going to do that. And so it's, a, it's an adventure. You get to drive on the wrong side of the road and then you know, like the, the language, even though they speak English, it's really funny. And I, I worked at a, at a hospital, I worked at a town called Fakatani because all the WHs are uh, a fussin. So I worked at Fakatani Hospital. And they were like, it was incredible. They sang me a welcome song on my first day. And, uh, you know, the road signs were all. Um, different and funny and I lived on the beach and it was just like a really, so it was a great perspective for me because I got to see like a more, just a, a, a really neat way to live life. Um, uh, let's see, I got to do some stuff outside my comfort zone. I was working in the ICU. I was removing coins out of kids' airways. Um, you know, they have a, a very different medical legal system there. They, they don't really do lawsuits. If, if a patient is like injured, they just, you, you, the patient makes like an application to receive money and it's sort of like, there's not, there's not really much of a fight. They just kind of get awarded money by a third party payer. And that keeps the doctor and the patient on the same side. Here it's very antagonistic. If there's like a, if there's an injury and the lawyers get involved, the doctor no, no longer communicates with the patient directly. And I, I don't think that's a good thing. I think we should always be the patient advocate um, and honestly, like my, my year in New Zealand really helped me heal. It really allowed me to see um, that it was really like the system can be quite harsh on, on, on all of us, the American system that is. The final thing I wanted to tell you is that it's the lesson that I learned is about time. So you remember the story um, that I told you about and a little bit about time. Okay, so time, when, you, when you're a kid, time goes by very slow because everything's really new. And when you go on these missions, everything kind of moves very slowly. But when you, when you get to where I am and you get into a routine, 
everything, like, it's like time speeds up because your brain doesn't need to retain memories of sort of like repeated patterns. And so all this like neat stuff that I'm doing right now, like it's great, it's great and everything, but I feel like time is now speeding up and I'm really like longing for something different. And I, so I do, you know, I, I love what I do. I, I do anesthesia, take care of babies, having heart surgery. It's very busy, I work very hard. Um, had a lot of fun with my surgeons. But I, I'll never forget about what that guy said in medical school though. He's like, you're never gonna have more free time. And I, I would encourage you to say no. That's not an acceptable thing. Like, I would encourage you to prioritize time over money. If you prioritize time over money, you're gonna be a much healthier person, you'll have a much happier practice. So, um, that's my final lesson, it's all about time. And I'll leave you with this, from Seneca, uh, an ancient Roman philosopher. Seneca, I'll just paraphrase what he's saying here, but basically what Seneca would say is, you would never let someone come into your house and basically like rob you of your stuff. Like, why would you let someone rob you of your time? And I think that's a lot of people are basically not very protective of their time. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. And I think that if you do that, you're going to be, um, you're gonna have a very happy life. So good luck. Any questions? Thank you, thank you. So going forward to the one day work in the international setting, how do you go about obtaining the skills that you would need to work in an environment like that? I mean, anything that you do is going to be useful. I guess it just depends. If you are going to do something that, like I do, where I do anesthesia, or my surgical colleagues, then you're going to go into um, a a surgical mission and go where there's like surgical needs. But if you're gonna do something primary care, you you would wind up doing something like totally different. And sometimes you're gonna be basically doing something that you might not have totally trained for. So primary care docs might go to a place for six months and they may be doing a lot of like infectious disease type stuff. You, you may be helping people figure out how to how to use have clean water. Um, basically teaching the community if, you, if you're in primary care. So it really depends on what what you decide to do. Um, so when you ask like what kind of, like how do you go about acquiring a skill set, it's like, that's a hard question because there's so many different types of skill sets and anything really that you do is going to be useful. Um, it might be a good time to, right now, to figure out what it is that you really like. So if you like surgery, you know, you're going to be able to apply that internationally. But if you like infectious disease or you like primary care, you're going to be able to apply that. Um, so don't forget at the end of the day, though, it's kind of like about maybe what you really enjoy doing and something that you think that you could do for 30 or 35 years. So, like, you know, if you, if you guys are interested in doing something difficult or something competitive, like dermatology or neurosurgery, I use those examples because people talk themselves out of that. I would say don't do that. It's, a, it's really about what you bring to the field. And so if you want to be a neurosurgeon and you're like, you, want to, you don't want to work as hard and you want to have a family, I mean, I would encourage you to, to, try to try to do that. And then you'll be the neurosurgeon that has a, a more well-rounded life. But don't, don't just like pick something because you think it's going to be applicable. And don't just do something because you're going to have like people say, oh, anesthesia is a flexible lifestyle. I mean, I know a lot of anesthesiologists that are really unhappy right now, and they don't feel like they have flexibility. So sometimes you have to fight for that stuff. So figure out what you really like, and then, and then you will have to fight for the life that you want. And, and anything that you choose is going to allow you to go and work for Dr. Left Orders. I mean, I, anything that you do, you'll be able to go there. I hope that, I hope that answers that question. Did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, that was it. It's just like, so when people start about tennis, like, I would have known, like, like, you might see tennis in the United States, so you don't have to see your tennis, I would have no idea how to treat So it's just like wondering how you go about preparing for things that you know you don't see here, but you will see over there. It's really funny because it was like, I don't you guys are probably too young, but there's this movie called Spies Like Us, where these two guys were pretending to be doctors, and they said, oh, you guys are doctors, like, 
well, you need to do this appendectomy. And they kept like going under the table and trying to read the book. And I mean, I kind of felt like that because I had this book open in the operating room and I was trying to read about stuff that I had, I had never done before and had never seen before. And that is something that it's both like good and bad. You have to, you're gonna be in a situation where you're, you'll have never done something. And so it brings into some like real ethical, there's gonna be a real ethical dilemma, but at the end of the day, if you, you know, the knowledge that you're building now is going to allow you to be successful later. And honestly, like the treatment for tetanus is really not that complicated if you can get it in time. You get immunoglobulins and you get diazepam for muscle spasms. And if you, and, and here in the United States, if someone's really bad, you can put them on a ventilator and do ICU care. But if you don't have a ventilator, then you know that you're done. The patient, the patient won't survive. So that's part of the adventure. I mean, I find myself, we're, we're pushing the envelope every day with what I do with these congenital um, heart babies. And every day is like, new ethical challenges. We have maybe time for one more? I don't know. I know we're short on time, but... Anybody else? How do you decide whether or not you should go on a medical mission if it's not sustainable? Aren't you potentially doing more harm in the long run? That's a good question. I never really thought about it. It was when I came back from Bachelor Left Orders in my Sudan trip, I was like on cloud nine because I felt so good. And my mentor from Seattle Children's Hospital said, Well, that's great, I mean, but that's not sustainable. And I thought, if anything, there was something sustainable, I thought it was that trip. So um, you could argue a couple different ways. I mean, I think what we were doing in, in Sudan was somewhat sustainable because we were teaching local people and we had something. We were constantly filling the positions. There was always an anesthesiologist there. And, um, and and it's about working with the local people to create something sustainable. And that, and that means teaching. You're teaching the local people, teaching them to do something with the supplies that they have. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like it, it, we got all our vaccines and everything from Paris. And um, so it's like, it's quasi sustainable. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, for the most part, I think like a lot of the things that I've done, I, I, I see all the good things. I see some harm too, but I also see like most of the good things. And being able to go to Thailand, or I went to Honduras and we did hand surgeries, and you know, like that's a chance. That's a chance for someone. If someone doesn't, if someone will never get their cleft lip repaired, that's like the difference between like a totally different life. In some cultures, that's like that's a that's a horrible life. Um, so, I don't know, I think you have to approach every situation and think, you know, am I being ethical, is this ethical, maybe it's, a, maybe it's not sustainable, but, you know, it's good, to, it's good to think about these things. I'll stay up here and answer questions until the next speaker kicks me out. <laughs> I think we have class in four minutes. You guys have class, right? Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll put this. Um, I'll put this up on the YouTube or something. Okay. Thank you.